There's a question which is asked by the Maral of Prague. Every Yom Tov, whether it's Pesach, whether it's Sukkos, whether it's Yom Kippur, the innate nature of the day is, is described in the Torah, either by its name or just by events surrounding it. For instance, what is the meaning of Yom Kippurim? Yom Kippurim means the Day of Atonement. I mean, it's a day that we engage in doing tshuva to be atoned. What is Pesach? It's the it's the time of our redemption. We were redeemed from, from Egypt. That's when we left Egypt. What is Sukkos? The Torah says explicitly, why do we have an obligation to sit in the Sukkah? That all the generations should know that when we were in the desert, we sat in Sukkos. We were protected by the clouds of glory for 40 years, which provided every conceivable amenity to protect us during that 40-year period. Whether it's regarding our travels, regarding our health, protection from the elements, everything was provided by those clouds of glory. The sukkah is to commemorate that. What about Rosh Hashanah? How does it refer to Rosh Hashanah? It's Yom Trua. It's the day of the blast. That's what it's called, referred to. But yet we know it's a lot more than that. It's a day of judgment. That every person's personal record, Jew and non-Jew alike, is audited on Rosh Hashanah. That means tomorrow night, the first day of the month of Tishrei, the beginning of the year, that's the Jewish New Year. It's the Yom Hadin, the Day of Judgment. What is the Day of Judgment? As the Ramchal explains, Rabbi Lutzato, that Hashem allows Satan, who's the prosecutor of the world, specifically the prosecutor of Jewish people, to audit every one of our records. And it's, we're put under the microscope. The attribute of mercy is suspended for this day. So therefore, we have plenty to be concerned about. And as perfect as our record is, maybe it's not perfect enough. When the day of judgment begins, at this moment, throughout the year, and when we say the Amida, we refer to Hashem as Hakel HaKadosh. Kale, the powerful one. It's an unpronounceable name of Hashem, who's holy. From Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur, which is a 10-day period, it's HaMelech HaKadosh. He's the holy king. King connotes justice. It's Mishpat. We have a blessing in the Amida, the restoration of our judges, our court system, and we say, Melech Ohev Tzdokum Mishpat. The king who loves righteousness and justice. But during the, this period of time, the, that bracha concludes differently. We say, HaMelech HaMishpat. He's the king of justice. Justice and king and King, go hand in hand. Because it's based on a posuk. Melech b'mishpat yam noritz. How do you establish order in, in existence? It's only through justice. And who establishes order? The king. The king establishes order. So tomorrow night is the first day of the year. We blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. After we blow the shelf, we say, today is the birth of the world. If you look in your mouser, Hayom Haros Olom. Today is the birth of the world. Today we stand in judgment. Now, tomorrow night, we know that the process of creation was a seven-day process. On what day was Adam created? Adam was created on the sixth day of creation. 
The first day of Tishrei, which is Rosh Hashanah, that's the Adam was created. And yet we say, today is the birth of the world. The birth of the world seemingly should have been six days earlier, the first day of creation. But yet we say, no, today is the birth of the world. Now, a woman, from the time of conception till the child is born, is nine, nine months all that happens during that nine-month period is gestation period. The fetus is developing and evolving, ultimately to be born at the time of birth. When the mother reaches full term, and what comes out? A viable human being, with God's help. Everything that preceded Adam was only to set the setting for the player of existence, for the one who existence was created for, that he should come on the scene. So for all intents and purposes, when was the world, when is the birth of the world? The birth of the world is not when it went from ex nihilo to start evolving. It's when Adam came on the scene. So Aleph Tishrei, the first day of Tishrei, which is tomorrow night, in that morning, Adam was created. Hayom HaRas Today, we all stand in judgment. And we say, if we're like children, we ask Hashem to treat us as children. But even if we're subjects, He should treat us and have mercy on us because we're His subjects. But what's a subject? A subject means... I'm dedicated to the will of my master. That's a subject. You're the subject of the king. You know, if you belong to the uh, American army, you're called the GI. When they put that dog tag on you, it's exactly the same as a dog tag. We have somebody here of that nair in there. Dog has a dog tag. When you're in the army, you happen to be a human being, but you're a government issue. You belong, you're under the auspices of the United States government. If there's a, a question of, of a court, it's a it's a military court. It's not the regular court, secular court, which adjudicates your case. It's military. You're a subject of the of the armed forces of the United States. Lahavdil Elif Abdullahs. We are subjects of a we're subjects of Hashem. He dictates every aspect of our lives. He wills our lives, he dictates our lives. And we're bound to his will. When you're in the army, if a person goes and doesn't follow orders, he can be court-martialed. He's arrested. That's called insubordination. Insubordination. But yet, people say, I believe God created war. I know he said, but. What's the but? The but is insubordination. You're bucking the system. Person doesn't believe in God is one thing. You believe, and you said, "This is what I choose." What do you mean you choose? And we say that at one time there was no such thing as democracy in the world. The world was a monarchy, or controlled by dictators. The citizen of that country, or you want to call it the subject who lived in that country, had no say in his life. Whatever the king dictated, you had no say. And if you were ever critical of the king, you went to the guillotine. Or you're thrown into the lion's, the lion's pit. People understood, I exist for the king. And if I disagree, you better keep it under wraps and not divulge your position vis-a-vis -vis the will of the king. But today, it's a whole different world. We, we're, we live in a free world. Free enterprise. Democracy. I have a say. I have as much say as anyone else. So once we have that kind of sense of leeway, of freedom, even God doesn't dictate our lives. It's like a mindset. We have a light. We have a right. Of course, if we do the will of God, it's another situation, but we have rights. At one time, the whole concept, you have rights, you have no rights. And that's the reality. You have no rights. You know, a person says, you know, I have a right to eat dirt. 
you can eat dirt, but you know, you're going to get sick and you're going to die. So that's not a right. You have a right to take your life, God forbid. It's a right. It, it, you have the ability. It's not a right. You have the ability to take your life. It's not a right. Because there's nothing right about taking your life. God forbid. So when God gave, gave us laws and you violate, it's not a right. You exercise free choice. But what you exercise is not a right. You exercise the foolishness. Because whatever you do against his will, because whatever he provides for us is only in our best interest. As much as we don't want to believe that, because we don't understand that, but it is. Because if you understand who God is and what the purpose of existence and creation was, and you have the orientation and knowledge base, you would understand that. But since people don't, they feel God is imposing themselves. God is infringing on their lives. God is putting them in, into a straitjacket. Putting, giving them the ultimate level of limitation, which is not. A parent teaches a child study habits. So when he gets older, he should be able to take control of his life and be productive. But the child, before the child develops those study habits, the child feels the parent is, is an ogre. You're reining in on me. You're controlling me. You're torturing me. Because you want to be, it's like you know, breaking a bronco. You got a bronco, uncontrolled animal. Horse, you got to break it. Once it, it, it's broken, then it follows orders and its pace is, is, is perfect. It's same thing. So the day of judgment, God is the king. We are his subjects. The king establishes order through justice, not through mercy. Once you have order, then you can be a little flexible. But if there's no order, there's no parameters, then there's nothing. The world is not a free-for-all. Do what you want. The, what we call the boundaries. The boundaries in life. We have to have personal boundaries. You have laws which put limitations on people's behavior. And only then could you have a functioning society, a functioning world. So the day of judgment, New Year's, what we call Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, the Torah refers to it as Yom Trua, the day of the blast. What does that mean? So we know you take a ram's horn, you blow the horn, that's the day of the blast. But what about, but the Torah conceals the essence of the day, which is the day of judgment. Why is the Torah concealing it? When we speak about Sukkos, but Yom Kippur, the Torah is very open. They have atonement. You do tshuva, you reinstated. Sukkos commemorate the clouds of glory, the booths that we make and meeting all the criteria, house that has to be built. That's the equivalent of the clouds of glory. Matzah, we recline, the Seder, we tell over the story, the bondage, the redemption. We're celebrating freedom. But why is the Torah concealing such a significant day where it's so valuable to understand what the nature of day is, that is the day of judgment, that our records are being audited? So the morale says a principle that every holiday, every Jew, regardless of what level he's at, has to be able to relate to that holiday in a state of joy. Person has no background in Judaism. And say, you know, it's the day to bless the shofar. And the shofar commemorates the binding of Isaac. You know, Lahavdil, El of Dolter goes to the Jewish Museum. It's interesting, you know, especially when you get in, you don't have to pay a fee to get into the Jewish Museum. It touches your curiosity, you know, you're learning. Jewish folklore, Jewish who knows what you want to call it. Every Jew could could enter as an entry point if they have the blessed the chauffeur. You have to be truly learned and have a background to appreciate what that audit is. For instance, a person runs a business and the cash rate register goes 18 hours a day. 
but the person never takes inventory. Never, never, never has an audit. He thinks he's making money, but he doesn't realize, based on his overhead, his cost, and his profit margin, the man is hemorrhaging. Here he thinks he's going up and he's going off the cliff. So you have to have an audit. You have to have an, an evaluation of reality to understand where you're at. Once he, Hashem says, we have to have an audit. Hashem wills this existence. Once a year, the beginning of the year, a year has passed, we're going to do an audit. The audit takes place on the first day of the year. What we call Rosh Hashanah, that's the day of judgment. A person who really keeps sloppy books and he's not meticulous to be able to straighten out and understand where he's at, everything's in disarray, it's overwhelmingly confusing. You have to call in the, the professionals. Cost you a fortune. You hear what it costs? You say, you know something? Look, I evaded the IRS so many years. Hopefully I'll evade them longer. They won't notice me. I'm not, make sure no red flags. But you understand you're only deceiving yourself. You're putting the monster in the closet. You never know when that monster is going to come out. Hashem says, to be responsible, we can't let a lifetime pass. At the end of the lifetime, you're going to straighten out a lifetimes of, of failings, of shortcomings. Every year, we're going to make an evaluation. You got to introspect. You have to understand where you stand. And you have to understand who you are and who I am. And you only understand who you are when you appreciate who I am. And if you know if I am the king, I am the one who dictates, I'm your benefactor at every level, then you understand why you're the subject. You know, there's an expression, you know, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Unfortunately, many people bite that hand that feeds them. Why? Because they believe that despite biting the hand, that hand's going to continue feeding you. But if there's justice and understand the severity and the exactness and the precision of that justice, and if you're in touch with reality, it's not so simple. I'll give you an example. This past year, since October 7th, the world was disastrous for the Jews particularly. Globally, there's no place in this existence that's not tottering on many levels. Politically, wars are going on, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, the Middle East. But who's the focal point? And as extremely savagely what happened then, the world takes it with a grain of salt. As they say, Jewish blood is cheap. It's a chapter in, in Psalms. They spill our blood. Our corpses life, pray for the what? For the animals, for the scavengers. It's okay, it's Jews. Six million Jews in the Holocaust. You know something? Maybe even one Jew is too many in terms of the world, the level of anti-Semitism. We're holding global anti-Semitism. It's even worse than World War II, pre-World War II. One time, anti-Semitism was in, in Europe. Today, there's no place in the world where there's no anti-Semitism. On an extreme level, on a pre-World War II level, we're at a place that we were never at. Since the Middle Ages, we haven't been at this place. Something's going on. Why? And why the casualties? And what about the soldiers that were killed? And they were maimed for the rest of their lives, losing arms, legs, blind, whatever whatever happened. This was all decided last, last Rosh Hashanah. That's the day of judgment. So in retrospect, understanding what is determined and what's decided on this day, Although you have three of Kippur. But it's this period of time. That's how serious it is. And based at how we correct that record, and the level of sincere, honest, authentic commitment, that will make a difference what the future will bring. But you understand, understanding that, you have to have a certain degree of maturity. You have to have a certain degree of background. You know, the person who, who runs a, a business 
responsibly and he's astute. He wants that audit because he wants to be secure. He wants to be in solid ground knowing exactly where he stands, where he should put, where he should invest, where he should upgrade, where he should downgrade. So that person is a well-weathered person. If you're a well-weathered Jew, we know nobody's perfect. We all have blind spots. We all slip. We regress. This day actually brings us to reality. You know, during the year we get we get sloppy, we get distracted. And as a result of that, we fail many times. But now, during the month of Elo, which is the month before Rosh Hashanah, it's a preparatory month. We begin preparing. We prepare for the big day. The New Year's. The Midrash says, what's the between the Jewish New Year and the secular New Year? The, the world on the second, what do they do? They drink, they brawl, and they kill one another. That's the second New Year. The Jewish New Year, when I'm quoting now as a Midrash, is the most solemn day of the year. It's the most serious day of the year. Understanding the repercussions, the ramifications, the consequences of what's going to take place on this day. We say on tomorrow, I mean the daytime, we say in the Son of Tokif, and we say the angels in heaven, they tremble because of the exactness of the justice. And what they understand, we don't understand. And we say many things there. Who will die by the sword? Who will die? By, who First of all, who will live? Who will die? And if you die, God forbid, how will you die? By fire, by sword, by drowning. Many ways a person could die. Just now, there was just a report. The Israeli government divulged it when they broke into the, the kibbutz on the border. They took 27 children between the ages of zero to a few months, maybe a year and a half or four years old. They burnt them alive. Could you imagine? They burnt the children alive. You ever hear such savages, such level of inhumanity? It's not to be believed. But God allowed that. We don't understand the attribute of justice. We don't understand the six million Jews. A million children perished, were murdered during the Holocaust. We don't understand it. But you understand, we as Jews, we have communal responsibility. We're responsible for one another. And if you can make a difference in another Jew's life, that he should believe a little bit more or do a little bit better. We can't live our lives like within our own little cocoon. Jews are responsible for one another. That's what we have to live our lives. So Rosh Hashanah is referred to as Yom Trua, the day of the blast. What is it? Everybody comes in at his own level. When you come in at the more advanced level, you take that day seriously. You don't waste a minute of that day. Every day is fully, every moment is fully invested to maximize on it, to show Hashem that we're taking this seriously. Could you imagine a person's on trial for the death penalty and he walks into before the judge and he thinks the judge doesn't have mercy and he walks in with a flippant attitude, with a defiance, do you think he's going to evoke an iota of mercy from this judge? You don't even understand the nature of, of your misbehavior. You don't deserve mercy. But if you enter into that courtroom, and you're broken and devastated because you appreciate who you're not, who you should be, that evokes mercy. So understanding that Rosh Hashanah is not a day, you know, you just come with, with your, wearing your best and meeting people you haven't seen since the last year. A person doesn't know any better, you can't fault them. You can't fault these people. But a person knows better and should know better and doesn't relate to the day as it should be related to, 
God forbid that person gets the brunt of judgment. But even if they get the brunt of judgment, everything is on, could be reconsidered through Yom Kippur. You can undo whatever is decided on Rosh Hashanah, you have through Yom Kippur. There's a stay of execution. Person that's tshuva, repents. Now, you know, a person who's impoverished, the government usually gives him a lawyer. I'm not sure what kind of lawyer he'll have. Quality lawyer. Hashem says, you know, it's not easy to do tshuva. It's not easy to turn over a leaf. It's not easy to make commitments. You have to be able to sense the moment. And only if you sense the moment, then you can make, you can make changes. So the Navi, the prophet says, Dishu Hashem Mimotso, Koro Korov. The Talmud quotes two verses. Moshe Rabbeinu says to the Jewish people, Mi Keshem Elokeinu Chol Karein Ilov. Who's as great as our God? The Jewish people, whenever we call out to him, he responds. And then the Novi prophet, the prophet says, Dishu Hashem Mimotso. Seek out God when he's found. Called him when he's close. Seems to be it's contradictory. The greatest prophet says, we're able to call out to Hashem whenever you choose to call out to him. Whenever we call out to him. And the Novi, who's less than Moshe Rabbeinu, says the name of God, seek out, seek me out when I'm found, call me when I'm close. So it seems to be the times you can't call out. It's only when he's found and when he's close. But if he's not close and found, he's not available. So how do we reconcile both statements? Moshe Rabbeinu's statement and the Navi statement. So the, the Gemara tells us, the Talmud answers, Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking about when the Jewish people call out. What the prophet is speaking about as an individual. When we call out as individuals, God, because God is so close to us, as a result of that, even though we not, it's not within the context of a community, God will respond because of the nature of the moment that God has found that God is so close. Throughout the year where God is removed, you have to have the merit of the, of the community. It's called tzchus You have the merit of the community. You have the merit of the community, regardless of when it is, God is always attentive to our supplications. That's how the Gemara, the Talmud, reconciles both statements. The statement of Moshe Rabbeinu and the statement of the Prophet. It's interesting. The Rambam, who's a codifier, he writes in the laws of Tshuva and he cites the verse of the Novi. Dishu Hashem Mimotso. Seek out God when he's found. Kro'ohu biyosa korov. Call him when he's close. He says, Elu asari yomim ve'in roshani yom kippur. These, this, Period that Prophet's speaking about is the 10 day period from Rosh Hashanah 3 M. Kippur. And he says, if we call out to Hashem, he responds as an individual. Then he says, however, throughout the year, when the Tzibur, that means when the congregation calls out to Hashem, Belayf Shalem, with a full heart, fully committed, Hashem responds which is interesting. The Rambam, when he states and the differentiation between an individual and the community, when he speaks about the individual calling out and supplicate Hashem during the 10-day period, he doesn't say the individual has to pray the leif shalem with a full heart. Any, the slightest degree, nuance, that you want to come back, Hashem is there for us. Throughout the year, even the tzibur, even the congregation, the community, which has another dimension of value, it has to be believed. Show you have to call out to him with a full heart, fully dedicated. Then you have to be worthy. 
The worthiness is your level of dedication. During the 10-day period, you don't have to be as worthy. God is so close to us. He's just waiting, like a parent is waiting for a child. Just to indicate he wants to come back, the ch parent will grab that child. That's the 10-day period between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. That's how available God is. There's so much divine intervention because it's not simple to do tshuva. God is willing to give every level of intervention and sensitize us, give us a sense, which that sense we don't have throughout the year. You know, before we begin the fast on Tisha B'Av, Tisha B'Av, it's the most tragic day of the year. All tragedies throughout history, which the Jewish people experienced, happened on Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av, the destruction of the first and second temple, Betar, which were a remnant of the Jews that were left during the second temple period. There were a million Jews who were massacred, massacred by the Romans. And the rest of the Jews went into exile because of this. All this took place on Tisha B'Av, ninth of Av. Before we begin the fast, at the Tisha B'Av, we experience as if we're mourners. We don't wear leather shoes. We sit on the floor. We don't eat. We don't drink. We don't anoint ourselves. We don't bathe. All the laws which pertain to a person who lost one of his closest relatives. We're all in a state of mourning. We're grieving. So before we begin the fast, we eat a, a meal. It's called Surah Mavsekis. It's the meal before to, to, to connote what we're about to enter into. What do we do? You sit on the floor. You eat a piece of bread. You eat an egg, which is the food which normally a mourner eats. And you dip the bread and, or the egg into ash. And you eat it sitting on the floor. This is the level how you grieve. It's called Suda Mavsekis. It's the meal which indicates that the eating period concludes. You're about ready to enter into the grieving period. On the ninth day of Tishrei, the day before Yom Kippur, the last the meal we have right before nightfall. On Yom Kippur, we have a Suda Mavsekis. What is this? It's the same words. The Suda is a celebratory meal. You set the table with your best cutlery, your best dishes, quality food. You celebrate. What are you celebrating? Same word. But you're entering into another zone. When you enter into the zone of Tisha B'Av, you're entering a zone called grieving. The most painful day in the history of the Jewish people. Yom Kippur, it's the most illustrious day of the Jewish people. You hear this? 24 hours, 25 hours. You're not eating, you're not drinking, you're not wearing leather shoes. You're standing endless hours, you're praying, confessing. This is the ultimate, could you imagine? And we celebrate, not at the end of Yom Kippur, we celebrate before Yom Kippur starts. What does that mean? Meaning we have such faith in God that the Day of Atonement is such a day we're ready. We've already received the bonus before the day even began. We're already celebrating the upcoming opportunity. Hashem has given us an opportunity to correct. We're able to unload baggage, which normally you can never unload that kind of baggage. You just have to have remorse and you have to make a commitment. And even if the commitment is slightly deficient, because it's the 10 days of mercy. And the ultimate mercy is on Yom Kippur. Seek out God when he's found. Supplicate him when he's close. That's what Yom Kippur is. There's a work, it's based on the Zohar. He says that on Yom Kippur, you know, you start fasting, it's not too bad. You've eaten a, a meal, about three, four in the afternoon. It's a long day. And the fast is getting to you. You're standing a long time. Your feet hurt. You're fatigued. You're worn. You're weary. And people, they start looking at their watches. You know, how many hours? You know, everybody's talking about the break fast. 
Yeah, that's what they're talking about. So the Isod Vashish Avoda, I said this commentary is based on the Zohar, says there's a mitzvah of Yom Kippur, you should afflict yourself. Could you imagine a person has today, unfortunately, people, it's called body defacement. These stuff called body armor. Today it's called body defacement. People are tattooed from the necks down to the toes. And when they wake up, they realize there's a procedure, it's called a laser procedure, that you're able to remove all the tattoos. Would you know something? It's besides being very costly, it's supposed to be very painful. Very painful procedure, this laser procedure. Take off these tattoos. Some people even have tattoos on their foreheads, on their skulls. I mean, it's, it's craziness. But you want to know something? As much as it's painful, but every, every procedure of laser removes that disgraceful whatever representation on the body, that defacement. When we entered Tiam Kippur, we're coated and entombed in spiritual impurity. If you follow God's prescription, you do tshuva, repentance, and you have verbal confession, and you're in a state of fasting, and you're in a state of affliction, every moment of affliction is a positive commandment, you're peeling away. That's the laser peeling away the impurity. It's, it may be, it's painful. But understanding the value of that pain, you wish it would continue. Because you hope by the end of Yom Kippur, you whistle clean. That's the reality of what Yom Kippur is. Rosh Hashanah. God has just entered into this existence. Dear Hashem be Motso. Seek out God when he's close. Call him when he's found. Call him when he's close. This is an audience with God. It's even more than the Amida. Amida, we're having an audience, but God is there and we're here. During the 10 day period, it's not God is there, we're here. He's here, we're having the audience literally face to face with him. And Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment, you're looking the judge straight in the eye, Kavayoko. It's a long day, you know? Last time they finished services at 11.30. This year they're already at 12. You know, the cantor, you know, he's overstepping his bounds. He's abusing us. What are you talking about? Every time you acknowledge and praise and acknowledge God as the king, that puts you in a more secure place. That silences the prosecution. So rather seeing it as an infringement, a detriment, this is the ultimate opportunity. You ever see these people, they rappel up mountains and they have these, they hammer in these metal spikes and they have these chains and they go up the side of a mountain and they're ready climbing for a while. They even sleep on the side of the mountain. And when they get to the top and they're nearly at the summit, it takes a tremendous amount of power to pull yourself up there. Literally, we feel, feel that your muscles are about to explode. But you know what it means to get to the top of that mountain? As painful as it is, you want to get to the top of that mountain. And if you get to the top of that mountain, then you've succeeded. You've conquered the mountain. Rosh Hashanah, God says, I'm giving you a day. Acknowledge me as your king. Blow that chauffeur, which brings back the merit of the Akedah, the binding of, of Yitzchak, which will silence something. Coronate me. Acknowledge me. Be my subject. And all this stands in your good stead. And that will silence the prosecution of Satan. And you're complaining. The service is too long. Every word you say, which is praise and acknowledgement, you're, up, you're being upgraded. I'll give you an example. Lahavdil. person goes to the airport. And they put him on a waiting list. We're not sure if you could get on the plane. He said, by the way, you know, my grandfather's J.D. Rockefeller. Oh, J.D. Rockefeller. He said, you, you're off the waiting list. You're going to have a seat. Gets on the on the plane. The one who's given out seats doesn't know he's, he's J.D. Rockefeller's grandson. They put him in the way in the back of the plane where the seat doesn't even go back. He calls the stewardess. 
And he says, by the way, do you know who I am? I'm J.D. Rockefeller's grandson. Oh, we're going to move you to the center of the plane. And right by the wing where you hear the engines. And you can't even sleep because you feel the vibrations. Next to it, comes up. He says, by the way, you know who I am? J.D. Rockefeller. Oh, we're going to put you right before business class. All of a sudden, business class, he has the way they're serving a hand and foot to the people in business class. He says, by the way, I'm J.D. Rockefeller. He says, oh, we're going to put you in business class. Okay, he's, he's, he's moving up. And he doesn't mind moving up. He goes, moving up means he's being in a better place. Then he, he's in business. Then he realizes this is a first class before business class. Tells the business class, different type of steward, different type of, of, of cuisine. You know, I'm J.D. Rockwell's grandson. Oh, we're going to put you in first class. He's already sitting in first class. But you know how many times he had to change his seat and take his luggage from the overhead bin and bring it up front? When you're moving into first class and you're moving up, it's okay. You're in a better position. You're getting closer to where you should be. And that's where you're supposed to be. Then all of a sudden he realizes there's a cockpit. He doesn't understand the cockpit. He doesn't belong in the cockpit. And ends in first class. Okay, that's a little humor over there. But that's exactly what Rosh Hashanah is. To pray appropriately. To articulate the words. And understand what you're saying. And be focused. Because it's not a game. It's not lip service. There was a story. Many years ago. You know, uh, NYU has a school for acting, acting school. They have part of it. And a certain person I know, he's a student of mine. He was at NYU in the business school. And um, he was a student originally at Ramaz. And when he was a high school student, he was trained in uh, martial arts. So he's walking outside the school and he sees a few Hasidim being attacked by some hooligans. But he didn't realize that was that was that was the movie set. Yeah. So he goes, he runs a flying in the air with a kick, knocks over the hooligan because he thinks that the religious people being accosted. Afterwards he realizes this is just a, it's a movie, it's a movie, it's a movie set. That's what it is. You understand? It's not, it's, it's not, you're not, we're not staging. It's not a stage. Rosh is not a stage. It's not staging a setting. It's, it's the, it's the, you're on real time. You know, you go on before the, the, the court, you're before the grand jury, and they're going to decide what your fate is. And the thing, the person thinks he's watching some kind of game show. It looks like who knows what. No, this is not that. This is something. This is the real. You're on real time. Roshan, we're on real time. How we behave, what we think, how we invest every moment. I'll give you an example. We speak about Tamil Turk in Kulam. Let's say on this day, which is a very serious day, you invest every free moment in Torah study. What does that mean? That means every word you study on this day, which is the most special day, which every day you're under you're under the scrutiny, you're under the microscope, and you studying not to allow a moment to pass, and you want to maximize everybody, and you, and you, you maximize it by studying Torah. What are you doing? You're doing something very special. You're showing Hashem, I'm valuing because I'm in your presence. I want to do the right thing. During the year, I get distracted. But now that I have the cognizance that I'm your presence, this is the appropriate thing to do. I'll tell you an interesting story. When I was a student, it goes back a long time ago. It was in the 60s. And we studied long hours some that we would come back to this where we slept. It was like one o'clock in the morning after studying a whole day into the night. And we'd need a break. 
So we have something to drink, something to eat before we go to sleep. And then we go to sleep. Somebody had a tape recorder going while we were just talking, you know, innate conversation. And nobody realized the tape recorder is going. And then afterwards, when they realized they shut the it was going about 15 minutes. So I said to my friends, I said, let's replay the tape. Let's hear the nature of the conversation. When we heard the conversation, we were almost, we said nothing wrong, but we were almost embarrassed to hear the worthlessness of that conversation. Had no value. Talking about things which are people where we're coming from. Spending a whole day till one in the morning in the basement just studying. And go, even you want to, what you want to call, let your hair down. Just take it easy. The people, we should speak about such nonsense, foolishness, worthlessness. You know, you don't, we don't even realize what comes out of our mouths. Because we're so unaccustomed to think before we speak, unless it's in a certain context. A Rosh Hashanah especially. Maintain the cognizance of what the day is. Everything we discuss at the table. It's not a time to discuss politics. Trump or uh, the, uh, the Democrat. It's, it's not a time. You want to talk about the seriousness of what's going on. So to say to him to pray better. That's something else. But just to talk about politics. Are they withholding arms? Are they not withholding arms? Has no relevance to Rosh Hashanah. Be a better Jew on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem will provide what has to be provided. That's the perspective. And that's what God wants to hear. Because he's the one who ultimately makes that determination. Nobody else makes that determination. People ask me, who's going to win the election? I said, I have no idea. Whoever God will de decide should win, that person's winning. Regardless of whatever anybody thinks. And that's the reality. And that's the perspective, and especially on Rosh Hashanah, where if that's the reality, why discuss it? Discuss something of greater value. Okay, we're going to stop here. We should all merit exceed Simatova, as we have good Yar, a year of bracha and success, and Hashem should smile upon us. We should merit the coming of Mashiach, and we should merit only the sanctification of God's name in our lives, and Hashem put, should put us on a pedestal and come back to Israel, rebuild the Migdosh, and have what God wants us to have. Amen. Amen.